Okay, great. All right, so um, thank you um, for giving me the opportunity to share some ideas with you about artificial intelligence and education. And I'm looking forward to these conversations because um, the most important thing I wanna to say to start here is that um, you know, we're all in a mode here of learning right now and trying to figure out um, what this all means for us in higher education. Um, and so I'm gonna start with a very essential caveat, um, which is that, you know, we're all in the infancy of this, our engagement with this AI, um, and so both in society and education in our lives. Um, and so my goal is to really, for us to learn together. Um, if I don't have a good answer to a question, I'll let you know that. And I'm gonna make sure I don't uh, sort of just <laughs> ramble on in response to a question or a comment that I don't really know the answer to. Um, and so I hope that we have lots of you know, smart people in the room and then we can crowdsource um, any you know, issues that come up that I really don't know about um, and that we can um, move forward in all of our learning um, together in the session. Um, I'm not an expert in AI. Um, you know, like, many, like many of us, I've just been forced to initially to engage with it and think about it. Um, but having done that, it's become more interesting to me and to think a little bit more about the, um, the role that it can play in uh, higher education and, and supporting learners but also thinking about the, some of the um, the, thing, the questions that we want to ask about the use of AI in our, our courses uh, and in our own work lives as well. And so that's where we're, we're going to focus on today. Um, I'm going to give you a quick sense of what will happen here. Um, I'm going to start uh, with a little story. Um, it would help me think a little bit about um, the role of AI in my life and, and the role that it plays actually in a learning um, task that I had to engage in. I will um, then talk for a few minutes about John Dewey's theory of growth. Um, this has really helped me sort of winnow down some of the um, questions that we're asking about AI right, AI right now. Um, and this is a, a theory I sort of encountered um, over the last year or so. And we're getting so many ideas and so many different ways to think about this uh, AI right now. And so this one is kind of, this sort of very simple concept has helped me think a little bit more about when it belongs in higher education and in the role of a learner, a learner's sort of um, effort to sort of grow and expand their, their knowledge and their opportunities, um, and when it maybe it doesn't. And so this is a kind of a, a winnowing theory um, that I think can maybe help us think about uh, the sort of broader questions of uh, AI and higher, higher education. I'm gonna pose a sort of a case study, uh, ask you to sort of uh, respond to something in the chat, and then I'm going to try to, um, give some principles and three applications. So essentially the, the way this sort of is laid out before the chat question, it's more theoretical. Um, I'm gonna be making some cases, a case for um, like a way to think about what's going on. But then in the second half, uh, I'm gonna sort of dive into sort of more teaching, practical teaching strategies and ways to apply some of the, um, the principle that will come out of um, De uh, Dewey's theory. And then I hope that we'll have, we should, we'll have plenty of time for discussions and questions. Um, at the end. And so um, that's the kind of outline of what will happen here. So I'm going to start by telling you a story um, about something that happened to me, um, which helped me think a little bit more about the role that I, I wanted AI to play in my own life uh, in respect to a learning um, task that I wanted to undertake. And this comes from the fact that um, the story begins uh, during a very long surgery I had a couple of years ago. And during that surgery, um, I had a stroke. And during that stroke, um, it sort of it, it hit the, the language center of my brain. Uh, it's called Broca's area. And that stroke um, essentially robbed me of completely of the ability to speak. So I had complete aphasia when I woke from, up from surgery. And I had to sort of um, relearn to speak. <laughs> I had to sort of reacquire language for the second time <laughs> over the course of my life. Um, and so over the course of uh, you know, several months of working very hard on flashcards, um, speech therapy, you know, all the things that uh, speech therapist told me to do, crossword puzzles and reading things out loud and all these tasks, I was able to sort of gradually recover my speech capacities. Um, and so this was sort of a long and very challenging task I had. Um, I had to relearn this, this, this capacity that I had lost. And in the meantime, um, the sort of, you know, this was a really, it was really especially challenging thing for me because before I, I went into that surgery, I had signed a book contract. Um, so it was a strange thing and a scary thing to wake up and have no language uh, when you have a book contract hanging over your head. 
So I, um, the book was about writing. Actually, it was about writing uh, and how faculty members and uh, who want to uh, share their, their writing with a, a broader audience. And so I talked in that book a little bit um, as I was sort of rewriting it, as I was writing it, um, about the fact that one of the things that I think academics get sort of trapped in is the sort of the, the sort of language that we use, and we sort of it's very it becomes very repetitive, and very sort of insular. And so one of the um, arguments I make, it's just like one small section of the book, is it's important to sort of vary your 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 word choices, or to vary your, your like the verbs that you use, um, to sort of drive your sentences. It's a very simple writing uh, argument. Um, it's, it's not like new to me, but um, you know, it was, it was an argument that was sort of an important piece of the, of the book's main argument. So I turned my first, I, you know, I, I work all these, work my way through my lag, language re reacquisition. Um, I finished the book, I turned it into my editor, and she sort of highlights this section of the book and says, in a very gentle way, says, um, you know, you might need to look back at your manuscript with this advice in mind. <laughs> and I was sort of mortified at this and thought, well, huh, uh, okay, I guess so. And I went, I started re reading my own manuscript again and realized I was sort of sort of repeating this, the verbs over and over again, and sort of relying on a very small number of verbs to do the, the work of a sentence for me. And, um, you know, this was why, okay, I, th I had thought at that point that I sort of recovered completely from the stroke. And I realized I hadn't, I hadn't. I still had much more learning still to do. Now, this was happening not long after ChatGPT came out. Now, the, the, this sort of, sort of strategy of sort of improving your verb choices or your, your word choices is a, a quality in writing which is sometimes called burstiness. Burstiness means, that, imagine, you know, this, this quality of um, adding variety to your language. And ChatGPT is good at this, actually. It, you can sort of put this prompt in. You can put a piece of writing into ChatGPT and ask it to be, make it more bursty. And so at that moment, I had a sort of a choice as I was getting ready to revise the manuscript. Did I want to feed my own manuscript in ChatGPT and ask it to make my language more bursty? Or did I want to sort of struggle through the process myself to try to um, improve the variety of my own word choices? So. I chose in that moment not to use ChatGPT. And the reason for that was because I knew that if I could keep working on this skill for myself, um, I could maybe continue to improve my own langu language reacquisition. However, if I had sort of just asked ChatGPT to do that work for me, it might have slowed down my own um, process of regaining language. So in this moment, I kind of had this choice to use or not use ChatGPT or artificial intelligence for my own learning purposes. And that choice, I realized the better choice for me in that moment was not to use artificial intelligence. Now, I'm going to sort of use that case, that sort of story to set up um, the argument I'm going to make here. But we're going to see it gets more complicated. Like I made that choice in that particular situation. But in other kinds of situations, I might have made a different choice. And so we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about why. So this is just sort of a quick uh, slide about showing this, some of the flashcards I use to try to get myself back into language acquisition. Um, it's kind of interesting. You know, you, realize, you don't realize how much work your brain is doing to sort of when you're using language. My wife would show me these flashcards and I would think, oh, moon. Um, but actually what she was trying to get me to say is night. Uh, it's very hard to get these concepts, you know, to get from objects to concepts to theories and abstractions. Um, it's incredibly um, a challenging thing, that, uh, an incredible thing that our brains can do with language. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit now about this John Dewey's theory and it helped me think a little bit about my own situation, but then I wanna expand it forward. John Dewey, of course, is the American philosopher of education. Um, he was sort of pragmatist. He, he is sort of the founder, one of the founders of progressive education models. Um, it's very much, uh, in the United States, it's sort of you know these are sort of common ways to think about education, especially in the K-12 arena. And and edu uh, Dewey, at the end of his life, had sort of his, many of his ideas had been implemented in schools, and he you know these sort of progressive schools were sort of popping up everywhere. 
And many of them were saying, the teachers were saying, you know, we're going to throw everything out in traditional education. Um, you know, we don't, we don't need that stuff anymore. We're going to let students just sort of explore and, and um, learn on their own, based on their own experiences. Do we kind of want to step back and say, well, wait a minute here. Let's think a little bit about why, about why we'd want to use a traditional method or a progressive method. Um, and he wanted to kind of step back because he felt like the movement was sort of overtaking the theories that he had created. So in the series of lectures, he argues this idea that education is growth. So an educational experience should fuel growth in a student. And that growth expands them in some way. It opens their minds to new ways of thinking or acting. It gives them new opportunities um, in the moment, but also in the future. And so it's really important to think about growth as a sort of a, both a present and future oriented experience. So I grow, like literally my sort of the neurons are expanding, right? The neur neuron pathways in my brain are expanding and growing, but also my skills are growing. Um, and then also I see new opportunities to grow in my career or my future education or as a human being, right? So that's a good ex educational experience. So there's kind of three parts to this in Dewey's theory. Our path, we bring our past experiences to the learning experience. We sort of grow in the present moment as we're doing new things and expanding our capacities, okay, acquiring new skills, knowledge, whatever it might be. But it's also really important to think about what's opening up for us. What are the future growth possibilities being created in this moment? So Dewey argues that actually some experiences actually could be miseducative because they stop us from getting future growth, right? So they might rob students of skills or knowledge that would further their growth, that could harm us, excluding them from the learning environment or limiting their creative potential, right? These are miseducative experiences. So it might actually, an experience might have like give me present growth but stop future growth. And, you know, in my own sort of story here, this was part of the thing that I was worried about. It was going to help me sort of grow in the moment of sort of expanding my own manuscript, but it might rob me of future opportunities to sort of put these, that skill into, into future writing projects. So Dewey argues every experience that we have in a learning environment lives on in further experiences. And that can go either direction. Okay, so that's the basic theory. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit now, I'm gonna sort of apply this idea to, idea to sort of like a case, um, and then I invite you to think about that um, and how you would sort of respond to that case with this idea in mind. So let's think a little bit about the sort of way that we organize our thoughts and present them to other people. In other words, the ways that we, for example, organize an essay or a piece of writing or presentation, or the work that our students do in these, many of these kinds of assessments that we give them, especially um, ones which are based on writing. But it can also, any kind of thing, right? Solving a problem, following a procedure, right? The ways that we have to organize ourselves, we have a, lot of, like a swirl, a massive thoughts swirling around our, our brains. How do we organize those and present them to somebody else so they can understand them? Now, many of us have these sort of analog methods that we use. For example, you know, using a whiteboard. I love to use a whiteboard um, when I'm trying to plan out an essay or anything else that I'm trying to organize. Right? I probably many of us do something like this, either a whiteboard or we're using a notebook or we have digital tools that help us do this kind of thing. And we put our own ideas into there and then we kind of move them around until we find the organization that is gonna help us uh, present them to the right, the audience that we're trying to speak to. So, for me, um, and perhaps many of you, um, this kind of analog method of organizing our thoughts um, is the one is, is, you know, that works for us. And it actually, for me, I can see that when I do this and I start to erase things and move them around, I see new possibilities. So for me, it's like a, a path, a growth path toward creativity and new ideas, right? So I want to keep doing this process for myself, and I want to make sure that students who might also benefit from that process, have opportunities to do that, to practice it, to refine it, to reflect upon it, right? So that's this idea of sort of, sort of different methods of sort of organizing our thoughts, our own thoughts, 
um, and using the process of actually organizing them is, is, a, is a cognitive skill that I want students to have. But context matters here. And so this is gonna be, this is the, the real challenge that we have with AI um, and its use in different places because what, what worked was, was for some students and might not work for others. So I'm gonna give you the case of a colleague of mine at the University of Notre Dame's Canev Center. He shared this with me and gave me permission to share it with you all uh, and other folks as well. Alex has ADHD and he uses ChatGPT to help him organize his thoughts. And it's a really interesting process. He'll take a walk, he'll speak his, uh, I, you know, that sort of massive thoughts swirling around in his brain. He speaks it into a uh, like voice to text software, feeds the transcript into ChatGPT, which suggests an outline for him. And he writes then from that outline. This process has increased his writing predictably tenfold, he told me. It's, it's in a, you know, writing challenge, uh, writing was such a challenging experience for him. He wasn't very productive because it was just so hard for him and so discouraging for him. Now, with the use of artificial intelligence, he's really expanded, it's really expanded his growth possibilities as a writer, as a thinker, as someone who can sort of reach other people with his ideas, his good ideas. So in this case, we have this sort of, you know, these sort of two different ways of sort of using, you know, having lots of ideas or thoughts, concepts swirling around and putting organization to them for, the, for, for an audience, right? So the question I wanna ask you now is this. So imagine that you're taking, teaching a course in which um, you know, you're asking students to do something like this, organize their thoughts for an essay, presentation, whatever it might be. And you have, two of these kind, you have both these kinds of learners in your class. For some of those learners practicing analog organizational strategies like a whiteboard, talking to small groups um, in their notebooks, whatever it might be, can promote skill growth writing and thinking for those students. And yet you might have other students for whom the use of ChatGPT can promote better growth or more growth as writers and thinkers. And so I want you to think about that for a second here. And I want you, I'm gonna invite you to post your response to that question in the chat. How would you support both these learners in the development of this important skill that's probably gonna be helpful for them, not only for their education, but also in their careers, how are you gonna support both of them in your teaching, in your, whatever it might be, your assessment, the classroom strategies, whatever it might be, how will you support both of them? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be quiet for two minutes and invite you to post in the chat and, and look at the uh, ideas of others. Two minutes starts now. <laughs> Sorry, that's funny, Ben Johnson. <laughs> Some good ideas in here. 
geben kann man. Just 30 more seconds. These are great. Mm. Yeah. Okay, these, these are great. So just save this chat and you, you got all you need out of this presentation. <laughs> I tell you what, there's a lot of great ideas in here. Um, this is wonderful. Um, so I appreciate everyone participating like this. Um, I'm gonna make sure I, you, I, did I stop sharing? Julia, what are you seeing right now? I see uh, your presentation, yeah. Is you have your mind, like, you is it presentation mode or are you seeing the- uh... No, it's not in presentation mode. I can see okay. your slides on the left. Okay, yeah. got it. Is that back to presentation mode? No. No. Yes. It is. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, so these were fantastic. Thank you so much for um, participating like that. So, um, and actually, you know, most of this, the things I'm, uh, the principles I'm not gonna introduce now are ones I saw already in the chat. And so we're kind of we're coming together on the same ideas. But I'm gonna give you three principles that help me think a little bit about this and then uh, give some examples of how we could apply those principles to three kind of sort of specific cognitive skills that might be helpful for us to think about um, as we're uh, teaching uh, any kind of course. So first principle is variety, right? Deep learning requires at least some struggle. And we just, we know that about learning. You know, we, you might've heard the phrase desirable difficulties. And the idea there is to think about the fact that sometimes we have to struggle a little bit to, you know, to learn something important. And that was part of the reason for, I made that choice for myself um, in the wake of my stroke, because I knew that I had to struggle a little bit if I was gonna re reacquire language. So, but at the same time, we shouldn't struggle all the time. Right, that would be that would be a terrible learning experience. We need rest, respite. We need to be able to sort of you know struggle sometimes, and then sit back and do something something that's more comfortable or familiar to us. And as a, the teacher, I want to make sure that students have both these kinds of opportunities. But that is going to be different for different kinds of students. So my goal is actually to make sure that to use to vary my sort of teaching strategies, so that at any moment in the classroom, some students are going to be struggling. And other students are gonna be like, oh, I know how to do this, right? This will be more comfortable for me. But then it's to switch that and have multiple opportunities for students um, to engage in different kinds of work. And so, um, you know, thinking about, you know, making sure that, for example, that, you know, Alex is gonna sometimes have to maybe work with some analog stuff just to see what happens. Can he make, can he make any progress in that area? And other times I need to sort of, maybe I don't feel comfortable with AI. I don't wanna use it, but at the same time, this is something I should learn to do because of course it's gonna be a part of our many of our, many of our careers, our students' careers going forward and probably our careers as well. So again, we, we wanna sort of give opportunities for both, um, but we make sure that everyone feels comfortable sometimes and then make sure that people have, if it's okay for people to struggle sometimes. Um, recently, I heard a good uh, phrase for this productive struggle, productive struggle, how can you create productive struggle in your classroom? Support um, and make it sure it's, it's productive. So that's the first thing, variety, reflection. And this is, this is I think, this is something we all need to kind of think about with AI. Um, the, the thing that's, that's amazing about it, it's just so quick. It rushes through these tasks that took us a long time to do. And that's, that's in many cases, that's wonderful, right? Especially for like, you know, everyday tasks, kind of busy work, that kind of stuff. AI is amazing for that stuff, but, 
when we had to do it more slowly, just because the limitations of our bodies and our brains and, and the nature of the task, it did kind of force us to slow down and reflect about what we were doing. We didn't necessarily do that reflection, but the opportunity was there. So one of the things that we can do in teaching, even when we're using AI, is to slow down the process and invite students to think about what's happening um, you know, behind my screen. What's AI actually doing? How does that work? Why does that happen? And reflect upon the output, analyze it, even go step by step you know, you could see it very easy to sort of have a conversation with ChatGPT in which you sort of continue to continue to prompt it um, to get exactly what you want. But what if we slow that process down? The first prompt, okay, what happened here? Why didn't it get me what I want? And what was wrong with this output? Now the second prompt. Now what happened here? How did it improve it? Where is it still missing things, right? We can just do this uh, uncritically and uh, unthoughtfully, or we can just kind of ask students to slow down. And this might be an interesting thing to do in a classroom, encourage them to walk through more gradually the process. And finally, sequencing. Sequencing matters, right? Um, I actually saw some of that in the, um, the chat examples. I, I don't like the calculator analogy. If we just say, you know, people are afraid of AI because in the same way they're afraid of calculators, because that's not quite right. Um, you know, we don't just sort of let, for example, my wife teaches kindergarten. She doesn't let her students don't use calculators. <laughs> they they wouldn't make sense because they don't understand how numbers work. And so, in in math, for example, you first you have to understand you have to gain numerous skills, numeracy numeracy skills, right? You have to understand what numbers mean, and you have to learn basically how they work and and sort of pair together. Um, then, and so that's your first sort of you, you have to grow in that area. Then you want to go deeper in math. Okay, then the calculator is a great opportunity to do that. And the sort of future things, that, the other kinds of digital tools that you can um, use to sort of go deeper in math. So, you know, these analog and AI tools may might may promote growth, but maybe they only get promote growth when they're sequenced in a, like a strategic way, in a thoughtful way. And so I think that's maybe part of what we have to do. What well, part of what we have to do is to think a little bit more about that sequencing making sure that students have the skills and that sort of they have to grow into the skill and then, then grow beyond the skill into new skills, new career opportunities, new, new opportunities for them to um, improve in their careers or education. So variety, reflection, and sequencing, I think are really important things. Um, and all through that, we, we want to make sure that we're being transparent, making sure students understand. If we're asking you them to, to struggle with something, Help them understand why are you struggling? Why am I asking you to struggle through this when you could do it with ChatGPT? So what's productive about this? How's it opening new pathways for you as a learner, as a human? So transparency has to be overlaid over all these principles and everything that we're doing. Okay, so those are our principles. I'm gonna talk a little bit now, some sort of three ways, sort of three areas of sort of cognitive um, skills or growth and invite you to think a little bit about, um, you know, what what we um, how we could put these principles into work. Okay, before we get there, here's sort of here's where we've been so far, and the sort of key principles that we'll think about going forward. Um, AI should inspire critical reflection on learning goals, practices, and especially our assessments. And so, I think you know the, the process of having AI available to us incorporating it into our, our courses, our own lives, it does invite us to think a little bit more and to consider what we're doing and why, and to invite students into the conversation. So I think that's an important thing to do as well. So AI can inspire us to reflect upon our goals. Many students, uh, many, I'm sorry, many teachers, kind of still, I, you know, I've given you a few presentations now on this material, um, I, I'm kind of surprised how many AI, how teachers are sort of still very wary of engaging with AI. But we as educators have to grow in this area. We have to be willing to experiment and to, you know, understand some of the ways in which we'll promote growth for ourselves, but then also for students in their future careers. 
um, in their future courses. So we, I don't think we can just sort of stand back and just um, sort of you know, focus on these analog methods. Um, we want to think about how AI sort of does belong in, in many of the areas that students might be working in in their, li their lives. At the same time, we educators, educators need to be challenged to grow. We also want to make sure that we are aware of the fact that, you know, some of these skills that are basic skills that students need to acquire um, might need to be reaffirmed. And these, some of these traditional teaching methods, you know, might um, be the, the more, the better way to do, um, promote, promote these kinds of growth in these sort of skill areas. Um, you know, again, we, we sometimes will see this uh, idea here with, uh, in terms of like memorizing things, right? And so, you know, when sort of Google was available and all, especially then we got on our phones, it was, all, information was everywhere whenever we needed it. And the notion here was that um, somehow we don't need to memorize things anymore. But actually, then we've sort of realized now that, you know, learning, learning science has sort of told us that that's not really quite true. That having things in your brain is actually really important for creative and critical thinking. And there's a huge body of research now on what's called retrieval practice, which teaches us that skills like critical skill, critical thinking skills and creative thinking skills um, are tend to be shallow if we don't actually have sort of things memorized in our brains that we can work with. And so we have to continue thinking about these things, consulting you know, what people are telling us about how people learn, um, practicing strategies in our own teaching that work with students, that help students learn and grow. Um, so this is kind of a, an ongoing task going forward. Um, sometimes psychologists call the work of, you know, um, using uh, these digital tools as cognitive offloading. Cognitive offloading, right? So I can offload some things in my life, right, that are, are fine. Like I, you know, using, for example, a GPS, um, and I can offload that to, to the, to the, um, to my phone, for example, but there might other, but there might be other areas which I don't want to cognitively offload because it's a skill I want to continue to have and, and it will help me, um, grow as a person. Okay. So let's think about three applications and we're talking about these, these are all in the area of sort of building knowledge and sort of organized ideas. Um, and developing them. So they're kind of all in this sort of general area, but I want to focus on three specific, three different ways to do that. In each of these uh, three areas, I'm gonna sort of say, okay, here's what I think, you know, is where, where things belong, AI belongs or doesn't belong. Um, maybe it belongs in a different sequence or how we can encourage in reflection on some of these different ideas, these, uh, this skill. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, let's start in a very basic way. Um, with learning con learner connections. And we know from research and learning that um, it's very important for people to make connections, personal connections with the things they're learning and to see how it might apply or relate to um, their own ex experiences. This comes all, goes all the way back to John Dewey um, and other progressive educators, right? I wanna make sure that I experience the course content in relationship to my own experiences and find some way to connect it um, with my own life history, things going on that are already in my brain, um, things that kind of um, my career path, whatever it might be. I'm going to show you just one example of what the research sort of uh, shows um, the importance of this. This is from a study that comes, it was published in Science Magazine in, in 2009. Um, and it showed, um, and I'll show you examples of the questions they used to get to this, this result, that um, when students were in, a, in STEM courses, were asked to make connections between the material in those courses and their own personal lives promoted both interest and performance with students with what were called low success expectancies. <laughs> That's a tough one, stroke brain. Um, the effect on performance was sort of, you know, especially important for students. Um, you can see that the, 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 the bump up of their grades, right, up to two thirds of a letter grade um, compared to the students who weren't asked to do this, make these connections between this, the course material and their personal lives. And how did they do this? It was very simple. They had their students in the courses um, respond to these kinds of questions. How to apply this concept to your life? How can it be useful to you? How does it apply to your future plans? And it gave, it gave them different ways to do that. Write about it, draw a map, sketch something, 
and then write about if you do that, you know, the concept or the sketch, write about it, right? So these were these were students were asked to do this on multiple occasions over the course of the semester. These were actually uh, these were like uh, high school students. But you know, the idea was very simple here. On a regular basis, ask students to pause and think about, okay, we're talking about this thing, this concept from science. How can you connect it to something that's already that's meaningful to you? And as you saw, this had a really uh, profound you know, effect on their learning, not only their, their performance, but also their, their interest. They were more likely to take more uh, STEM courses if they had these kinds of questions posed to them on a regular basis. Okay, so we know that it's important for, to, for us to do this, make sure that students have opportunities to think about the material in relationship to their own lives. So let me start with a little bit here with um, um, how they look sort of, analog ways to do this, right? Some of the ways that we traditionally have done this. And I think there's, you know, I there's sort of two interesting ways that I've seen this or have done it with myself. Um, the first is I use these, these things called connection notebooks. I've written these about these in several different places. But the idea is very simple. Um, traditionally, I have used, I used to use uh, analog method for this. Um, I would actually have students bring uh, blue exam books into the into every the class period every single day in my courses. Um, and once a week, at the, at the end of the class period, I would ask them to pull out those connection notebooks and write a one paragraph response to a learning learner connection question. And so once a week, I was asking those students to say, okay, tell and you know, tell me something about how this thing that we talked about today in, in class relates to something in your life. And here are the kinds of questions I would ask them to do that with. Connect to something you've observed in your experience in your everyday life. Have you ever seen this in a show, film, book, meme, TikTok, whatever it might be, right? Something that thing that we talked about today relates to something you've experienced in a, like a cultural context. And I would love to ask this last question. How could you connect something we talked about today to something you've learned in a different course? Where this is a literature class, tell me about something it connects to an political science course, a theology course, environmental science course. This is what, and these these were, you know, we do this once a week at the end of the semester. Students had made 15 of these interesting connections, and it really helped um, spark new ideas for them and for me also, uh, as it was expanded our sense of like what these connections could look like with our course material. So this is, so, so this is a very simple analog method for having students you know, engage in this process um, of creating new connections. I saw recently in a, a book by uh, Christina Moore called Mobile Mindful Learning, who does it in a different way, um, like a sort of one step up in terms of using sort of digital technology. And she uses images to do that. So students can be uh, encouraged or in, uh, assigned to go, go find examples of the course content in the wild, right? Um, in the wild, like everywhere outside of the classroom. Um, take a photograph, upload it to the LMS, and write a one paragraph annotation in which you connect it to something specific in the course, a conversation that we had in the course, a discussion board posts, a reading or assessment, whatever it might be. And so it's a different way to get into this, but still as the students are sort of going around, going uh, around in their lives, looking for things. You know, I, does that image or this, this thing I'm seeing right now, can I take a picture of that? And then make it connected to something we talked about in class. Okay? So that's getting, take advantage of that same idea here, uh, making these connections between the material and the learner's brain. Okay, so these are sort of, you know, more traditional way, more traditional, but I mean, not traditional, but sort of um, maybe non-AI kinds of ways to do these kinds of, uh, get to that skill, that, that mobile, um, that skill. But AI can do this as well. And so one of the ways that we can do this is to try to use AI to help us, actually. So we can use um, AI not only for help students create connections in their own specific brains, like coming up with them by themselves, but also as the teacher, I can use AI to help model this process. And I love this example from Ethan Mollick, who writes a Substack blog called One Useful Thing. He argues here, one of the things that we can do when we're introducing a new concept 
is to find diverse connections between that concept and things that might resonate with our specific learners, right? So we're making sure that students are, are seeing examples of connections they could find that are accessible, uh, informative, that relate to the, our specific context that we're teaching in, our local community, our actual campus itself, um, the potential careers that students might be having in your courses. So whatever it might be, AI can actually be a great tool for you as a teacher to find these kinds of connections and model them for the students. At the same time, asking them to do these kinds of things. So this is a process that we can engage in as well in support of the learner building those kinds of connections. And I'm gonna give you a great example about this, of, of this from um, an engineering professor who told me that in a, there's a professor on his campus who teaches basic chemistry. All engineering students have to take like chemistry one or whatever it means, the basic chemistry class at this institution. And this teacher did something really creative with AI to sort of make, start modeling these kinds of connections. In that course, he wanted a student, he has multiple kinds of engineering students in his basic course. And there's like, you know, six or eight different kinds of engineering method uh, majors at his course, in his course. But as a, you know, as someone who's not a, an engineer, he's actually a chemist, right? He didn't have that sort of um, re repository of examples that would come from all the different engineering disciplines. So he asked ChatGPT, for each of these chemistry, chemical um, concepts that come up, give me examples in all these eight disciplines or whatever of engineering. And so he's able to now to invite students to think about each sort of chemical concept or formula, or whatever problem, whatever it might be, um, in relationship to their own future career plans. So learning connections are really important. I want to make sure that students can see um, ways that they can relate the course content to their own experiences and lives. I want to have students do some of that work on their own. But I can help use AI to model that work through getting them you know, inviting, helping uh, it help me um, get new examples that I could use with my students that would help them then go deeper and potentially grow, potentially grow um, by seeing different kinds of examples. Okay, that's first application. Number two, building knowledge structures. So again, let's just think a little bit about what the learning research tells us. Um, one of the ways in which we build knowledge, maybe the sort of, you know, the core way of doing it is, um, we sort of have our individual experiences. Uh, we have these isolated experiences as we go around in our lives or as we're learning something new. And we tend to start to see patterns, right? And that the, as we see patterns between different concepts or ideas or experiences, we start to put these things together. For example, things that are sort of, you know, this versus vers this than that, or I can see these things are kind of in a similar area or things that look like uh, you know, perceptual similarities. They look, they look the same, right? And I start to then start using those, uh, no, I notice those associations and patterns to sort of build up a sense of like the theory or the abstractions or the, the principles that sort of help expand my knowledge structures. So this process um, is the way that we sort of build up complex structures that allows us to entire sort of, you know, structure bodies of knowledge uh, in, my, in our own brains. And so it's really important for us to think about how do we support that process? How do we help students notice patterns and start to use them to build things up? For example, you know, what we're trying to do here is to sort of help students see how do things hang together, right? Get them to the, stru the sense of uh, the structures, the hierarchies, how things relate to each other, or just sort of uh, you know, direct connections between things. Um, this contrasts with that. This compares with that. Right? These are the kinds of like the learning strategies or the, the activities that we know are going to be helpful for students. Okay, so let's think about that challenge or that cognitive skill that we want to sort of help uh, students develop. For a long time, I've been using this game called the Minute Thesis. And again, this sort of predates <laughs> um, AI and even sort of even the use of like digital tools. Um, I would use again the whiteboard. I'm a big whiteboard guy, um, and so this is a, be a course I would often teach in um, the contemporary British novel. And at the end of the semester, it sort of actually would be around this time of the semester, typically, 
Uh, we have a few weeks left to go and things are sort of, students are getting ready to work on their final papers, um, which are often comparative uh, papers. Well, I'm getting them to ready for the final exam. I would play this game with them called the minute thesis. And I would say, okay, I fill up two halves of the board with on the one side are all the novels that we've read, for example. And on the other side are the themes that we've talked about over the course of the semester. And I would actually ask students, okay, um, I would you know, hand a marker to a student in the, sitting somewhere in the front row and say, I want you to go up to the board and I want you to draw a line, two lines, one from, from, from the, one of the novels to two themes. And so the student would do that. And I would say, okay, everyone has to sit now and think for a minute about how you can connect these three different things together or go the other direction. Take immigration and connect it to Brick Lane and White Teeth, right? So you could go in different directions, but students would be, have to think very quickly about, okay, how do these things hang together? How these two novels could sort of be tackling the same themes? What would it look like for me to come up with an argument about how these things hang together? And so the first one do, student would do that, we would all do that. We'd talk about it for 10 minutes and then I would give the marker to somebody else and say, come on up. Now you give us a different one now. Uh, and so we would do this four or five times over the course of the class period. And by the end of that class period, students were able to kind of see, okay, you know, this we I didn't just read five different novels. These novels are really sort of coming together and can sort of, um, I can see the bigger picture here of this. So this, this is a really um, helpful thing for them to see or be able to do before the, we sort of, the culminating acts of the course, of the final paper, or the final exam, whatever it might be. Okay, so this is sort of a, a you know thing that I used to, to love to do. Um, so let's think a little bit now about like um, AI's uh, role in this, something like this. And again, from coming from Ethan Malik, um, he points out that this thing that I was asking students to do is sort of in, in an analog way. Um, is AI is actually really good at this, right? And they often will, it, it's very good at sort of putting unlike things together and just sort of seeing what happens and trying to find a pattern between these different things. So again, the question then becomes, okay, is it important for the student to do that work? Or do I want them AI to do that work for the student? And then the student has to then, you know, develop the, the ideas or the connections and the, see the pattern, um, work from the patterns to the essay or the, the exam or whatever it might be, right? So where, where does it sort of belong here? So AI, again, is not necessarily a either an or choice here because we can use AI if we think about reflecting and slowing down the process. I could AI, I could ask students to do something like this. Um, a, chat GPT has something called regenerate, right? The regenerating prompts. I give AI a prompt and then it, it'll give me an output and I can say regenerate. And it might ask, it'll give me a different set of, uh, a different set of paragraphs or an output, whatever it might be. You can do that multiple times. Or I could do something like this, right? I could ask chat at GPT to go through, essentially asking it to do these kinds of three different um, prompts are essentially like the, the sort of AI version of this. Right, and so it's multiple opportunities for me to see, okay, what are the potential connections here? Now, AI is doing that initial work for me, but it could be up to me then to think about how is, what are the what, what are the patterns that it's revealing to me across these different prompts. So we might think about it like this: if we're going to if we want to use AI to sort of in support of um, developing this skill, right? So for example, we start maybe working in class, searching for creating relationships with like the minute thesis game or something like that. That would be one way to do it. You could also do small group activity in a different sort of class period, a certain different uh, way to approach this. Ask students to work in small groups to search for possible relationships between concepts you prepared in advance. So for example, I might've given him, given them the, um, the connections that, I, that are potentially interesting and then say, okay, you find out the connections, uh, the, the deeper layers or the patterns or associations, whatever it might be. Or I could ask students to, you know, use the regenerate feature on JetGPT to produce multiple connections, do it many times, 
and then explain what are you seeing? What are the differences that you're being revealed here or you know the patterns, the real deep connections here? So in this case, I might ask you know students to walk through all three of these strategies. And, and that's give me the, the students are giving the variety, um, individual, small group, AI supported. And maybe you want to think about sequencing them. So they're kind of thinking about how they can initially develop the skill, but then going further with it, um, with the use of AI. Finally, let's talk a little bit about transitions. Transitions are, you know, the use of transitional strategies in writing. Um, seems like a small thing, you know, just have, there's easy ways to, you know, connect paragraphs to each other in a piece of writing. But I've sort of, as a long time writing teacher, I actually think transitions are often um, the reflections of organization or non-organization in a piece of writing. And so let's, you know, think a little bit about like the fact that the transitions might be something that can help people see how things are hanging together in like in a piece of writing or presentation or whatever it might be. So let's, you know, in writing, um, these are sort of levels of transitions, right? Order words are ordering words are like first, second, primarily, secondarily, blah, blah, blah. Right. These are words which are, I would argue, is sort of the lowest level of transitions. Right. I'm just saying, I'm going to tell you this, and now I'm going to tell you this, and I'm going to tell you that. Right. But there's no necessarily meaningful connection between those different things. And these are the sort of transitions that students typically will often come into a class, a new, a first year writing class, just they kind of know these strategies and they can sort of use them. Um, you know, if they don't really have any other um, sort of arrow in their quiver, they can use these strategies. They can always also use the relationship words, right? Also, but, moreover, furthermore, these are often kinds of, again, they're not that far away from ordering words. Um, they're additive, for example, also is additive word. I'm giving you this idea, but I'm also giving you this idea. <laughs> but again, there might not be like a meaningful connection between um, those paragraphs. And that might show me that these ideas are like just sort of a set of different ideas instead of being deeply and intimately connected. There's not an argument that's unfolding with its own logic instead of having just several different arguments, each in its own new paragraph. The kind of deepest level of transitions are, you know, what I would argue are sort of re repetition and echo. Like words or phrases used in a, like a preceding paragraph are repeated or echoed in the first sentence of a new paragraph, right? And, you, you know, these are kind of, is a more challenging strategy to implement, but it's a little bit more seamless. And it makes sort of, um, and often it forces the writer to think about how the transitions sort of, you know, um, pull together. Um, how do they hang together? When I'm really kind of forced to go deeper with my transitional writing. So let's say this is a skill that we want students to be able to develop in any kind of writing, uh, or even, even within like, again, like giving a presentation or um, in, in any kind of thing they have to present to an audience. This is the thing that actually AI is not really great at this. Um, so I use one of my prompts that I showed you earlier about connections between the different novels. And these are the first sentences of each of the three paragraphs. And you'll see there's actually no relationship between you know, these sentences and the previous paragraph, right? It's just saying it's, it, they're essentially um, block transitions, non-transitioned really. Um, each paragraph just starts with this no, new thing. Both novels do this. Both novels also do this. Both novels do this also. It, the word also isn't even in here. Um, and so, you know, I actually asked ChatGPT several times, I prompted it several times to give better transitions. And it just doesn't seem to be like one thing that it's, it's that great at. Because uh, it really can't understand um, the, the deeper logic maybe. Uh, of, I mean, maybe it's, it could be in better in different areas, but it didn't really give me a good sense of, um, to sort of order the reason for the ordering these paragraphs in this way. So this is a great place to think about. AI can give me something that students can work with and reflect on and analyze. So again, let's think about the sequencing here. Asking students, first of all, to identify the transitions in several different pieces of writing, and then use those pieces of writing to develop, students can develop model strategies, right? So I might ask students to read three essays and say, okay, underline all the transitions, Let's work together to think about what are we seeing here? What are the, what are the sort of um, the categories of transitions that we're seeing here? 
or I might want to just present them to myself, present them myself as a teacher, say, okay, here's some categories. Now, the things that you're all seeing now, we can fit into these different categories. Then ask students to bring their own writing into class, not only in their own, that specific class, but from another class. Bring a piece of your own writing in here and let's use the strategies that you've just learned about and apply them to your own writing. Finally, you could then move into that sort of AI generated work, um, add in, uh, give them a set of prompts for a course related essay, have them do what I did here, get some output and see what happens. And then ask them to identify the transitions and rewrite those paragraphs with new strategies. Now, again, that's not that the essay itself is not something I would say, you know, it counts as for the assignment, but it is actually a good tool um, to help students see how you can sort of the, the basic kinds of transitions that um, a person or a, a machine can create and how we can go deeper with those and use them to practice on different kinds of transitional strategies. And again, I think the transitions are kind of help us see the organization of a piece of writing. Okay, those are our key takeaways. We're almost done, done, almost done here. And then we evaluate any teaching tool we should consider as potential for promoting or limiting student growth. This might mean what I call unbundling our assessments. In other words, you know, if I assign an, assess an essay to a, student, to a student, at least five or 10 different things are being tested there, right? The individual writing things, uh, writing um, choices, uh, word usage, grammatical stuff, uh, the ability to organize thoughts, um, to write a paragraph, a topic sense, all these things, right? So we have to start thinking a little bit more about what do I, what do I really care about here? And where am I willing to let students sort of cognitively offload some of these tasks? And other ones, I really want to make sure that students are um, regaining or working on these particular skills. So I think this is, this is part of the long work that we have ahead of us. How do we unbundle our assessments? AI should not interfere with the culti cultivation of core cognitive skills, like the ones we've just talked about. Meaningful connections, organizing our thoughts, creating transitions. But we should recognize that it's value for potential growth um, for their future courses, for their careers, or even for their life paths, right? And so the second, third ones here, I kind of just want to think about, you know, sort of <laughs> the one, the second one there for, um, those who are sort of maybe um, the technophiles, technophiles, <laughs> and the last one here, um, you know, for the technophobes, right? We, we, we kind of need to think about, uh, we have to acknowledge and engage with AI, and I think that's important for us to do, and growth for us, us educators, but then also to think about um, where, where, do, where maybe it doesn't belong, and it might sort of rob students of that future growth. Just a couple quick resources here. Um, John, so the John Dewey piece uh, comes from a Substack blog that I wrote, and so you can actually get a deeper uh, version of that argument. Oh, sorry. Um, Chat GPT assignments to use in their classroom. This is like a short book, um, online open resource from University of Central Florida. Um, there's a lots and lots of good strategies in there. So if you're looking for ways to think about um, putting uh, some AI assignments in your course, they have, it's something like 60 plus um, sort of uh, assignments that you can use, um, really good. And Ethan Malik, Malik's uh, blog is, is you, know, you know, each one tackles one simple issue with uh, the use of AI in education. Uh, he does a, a good job of kind of laying some of those different things out um, and give you some, some, guide away, some guidance um, with the use of AI. Okay, I'm going to stop here um, and, uh, stop sharing my screen here and